To me, true beauty in botanical biohacking comes down to simplicity, which is why today we're covering a formula with a thousand uses, even though it's made up of only two herbs. I've seen extraordinary clinical results with this simple yet elegant formula. I'm going to take you through the history and pharmacology of the individual herbs in this formula, and then we'll go through the formula as a whole. The formula's name is Ermiao San, which translates to double awesome. It uses two seemingly opposite herbs, which complement each other perfectly. The first is an herb with a cold nature, Huangbai, Cortex Phyllodendri. It's very bitter, which causes qi to rise in order to sink. Because of the degree of bitterness, it has a very cold nature. It goes to the kidney and bladder meridians. This is used to drain what's called damp heat in the lower areas of the body. Basically, if you have water retention, you're getting swamp body, you're getting fungal infections, and these tend to drain downward. So the areas of water retention tend to drain into the lower areas of the body. So we use herbs like this to increase urination and very directly kill fungus. You can think of this just like draining the swamp. So to start off understanding this herb, we're going to take a step back in time around nine centuries ago, where a wealthy entrepreneur named Wang Shanfu used this herb to save his life. So part of Wang's lifestyle involved entertaining influential people with lavish banquets and drinking rituals. These marathons of drinking, feasting, and meetings in tea houses are part of East Asian life today, just as they were 900 years ago. It's a lifestyle I'm intimately familiar with, so there are details of Wang's life, which I can understand in a way that may be lost on those who don't have as visceral of an understanding of what this lifestyle is like. These rituals in East Asian society may look from the outside to be Dionysian affairs which lack temperance. In actuality, they're more acts of self-sacrifice on behalf of a larger group. I think this context is important because it can lend valuable context into the challenges inherent in this lifestyle. Now, just to give you some idea, imagine if your local court worked a bit like an auction house. Imagine having to bribe the judges and police so that they would actually enforce the law, keeping your extended family safe. In addition, just think about having private security around you all the time while traveling and guarding your FedEx packages from raiders. I mean, we send things in the mail and don't think about it. At this time, you'd have to send caravans. And even now, if you have a truck that's filled with something, maybe a coal truck, you have to have security with you. And good mercenaries don't come cheap. Those that can hire better mercenaries could well use them to rob you and prey upon your family. As a result of these social conditions, it's a necessity to attain power and wealth, not for personal comfort, but for the support and safety of your entire group. In rural China today, this is really the same. Even with the recent reforms by President Xi, which have greatly enhanced quality of living for the majority of people, uh, it's still very dangerous. And if you're not collecting power and money and influence, then you're not going to be able to protect your people. I've seen trucks laden with coal have to stop because people dug trenches in the road. And when the driver got out to inspect it, they would just commandeer the vehicle. And that would be anywhere from, uh, you know, twenty to $40,000 worth of coal. So what if you go to the police in this case? Well, the people who are robbing the coal truck will likely give the police about 10000 out of that. So you're not likely to find support with the police. And this is the kind of world that Wang lived in as well. So in this world, which is much of the world today and much of life throughout world history, this political leveraging required armies of loyal friends, various employees and spies of certain sorts, and this is all very expensive to maintain. In order to compete, just to have safety, there's an art to growing successful businesses and teams and networking on a scale that is difficult 
for most of us in industrialized Western European countries to comprehend. To get close with so many people, social lubricant is required in very liberal doses. So to give you an idea, this is a life that I, I lived as a protege of a businessman in China, a few of them actually, and I'll, this is exactly what our days were like. The night begins with three drinks, um, one for heaven, earth, and humanity. And this may be verbalized as saying, you know, to new friends, you know, to our brothers, whatever. Then five to 10 people may come and toast you, which means that you're doing a shot of about 52% hard liquor. However much they drink, you need to match them. Or it means that you're not really with them as a friend. And as you're drinking, and keep in mind, you probably don't want to be drinking because you do this every day. So it's almost a nauseating feeling that comes up. If you respect and like them or show that they're worth investing in, you'll drink whatever they're drinking. This is called being gangze or to go with somebody. So you're, you're in it with them for better or worse, thick and thin. And if you fail to drink as much as they do, it's a sign that you don't respect them. Now you may be thinking dinner party, uh, Americana where it doesn't matter so much. But when the head of the military and mafia and police are toasting you, you drink. Because these are the people who are, will ensure the survival and safety of your extended family. And it's also very wise to return the toast to them. And so as this progresses, you can imagine you're doing anywhere from 13 to 20, sometimes more shots in a night. So the drinking in this case is often used strategically to lower someone's willpower because the next day over tea is when people begin to sign contracts. So once the banquet is over, the music is done, and everyone retires for the night, then people are usually carried home or slightly you know, dragged home from your carriage or car. Uh, it's usually by a bodyguard as they tend to be strong. So among the servants, the bodyguards tend to be the ones who take you up to your room. You do your best to drink some tea to sober up so you can rehydrate, but many times people just pass out. I have been the bodyguard carrying people up, the live-in doctor using formulas to help wealthy men, and I have also been the one carried and redressed by servants, so I know this drill from all the angles. The next day, you don't get the luxury of sleeping in. This isn't uh, a college homecoming drinking ritual in the United States where you can wake up at noon and then tube down a river. A successful night out means that you have tea in the morning. Business details are carried out over tea and a failure to show up for the tea the next morning, it shows that you lack internal fortitude. So now imagine this lifestyle plus sleep deprivation over the course of months and even years, and it creates very unique patterns of illness. So I've seen men with the same condition I'll describe with Mr. Wong. After retiring for the evening, he couldn't pee. Instead, his abdomen was hard and distended so he couldn't get to sleep. His distended abdomen became painful. There's a historic account of yellow fluid weeping from his legs, which were swollen with edema. His eyes were said to be bulging out. He sent for a famous physician, Li Dongyuan, one of the most prominent of the Jinyuan dynasty. Li thought about a statement from the Su Wan, which was written nearly a thousand years earlier. Yin cannot generate without yang. Yang cannot activate without yin. The urinary bladder is like the official in charge of rivers. It's where the fluids are stored. Only when the urinary bladder attains gas transformation will the normal physiology return. This is an interesting concept. It's only when a certain gas arrives that fluid can exit. So let's shelve this idea for now because 2,000 years later, a scientific breakthrough seems to support it. Li Dongyuan told the patient, you feasted too well. The inflammation accumulated from the food damaging the waters of your kidney, leading to dryness in the urinary bladder. Without urination, the inflammatory fires rose, leading to nausea. 
Now, this sounds very strange in terms of normal physiology, but as we look a little deeper, we can break it down. Now, Li Dongyuan used a formula consisting mainly of Huangbai, cortex philodendri. He used a formula which was um, Huangbai, Zhimu, which is an amarina, rhizome, Rogue cortex, which is the outer bark of cinnamoni, and qian shi, uriel seeds. After a while, Wang Zong felt the burning pain in his pelvic floor. Then urine rushed out like a bursting dam. His edema went away within the next couple of weeks. Fast forward from there 900 years later. I used this exact method myself on a Mr. Lin who lived the exact same lifestyle and as a result found himself in a very similar condition. Four years ago, I was a live-in doctor and bodyguard slash protege for Mr. Lin. He was a kung fu master and businessman. In the late summer, the windows were all open. We'd returned from a banquet followed by karaoke, which was followed by barbecue and beer. We returned home at about 2 a.m. I took my recovery herbs, drank as much water as I could hold, and laid my head down on a spinning pillow. As I was going to sleep, I could hear muffled groaning. Because our apartments were positioned around a central courtyard, I went to his room. Now you may be thinking, what about his wife? Wouldn't she be there? Actually, she had her own quarters with her extended family. So there are areas in rural Sichuan where life really is like it was 900 years before. So I went to his room and he was bleary and he showed me his distended belly. I offered to help, but his pride was in the way. I couldn't go and get herbs, one, because of the time of night and also because if people knew that he was in this agony, it would show weakness and it would bring instability on the entire clan. He spat some blood onto the toilet. Um, the fact that he was spitting up blood was you know, obviously concerning. And the blood was coming from his throat and he was pretty hoarse at that time. So the next day I wrote the prescription and a loyal servant went to see it filled discreetly. So using Li Dongyuan's formula from 900 years earlier, I was able to help Mr. Lin begin urinating and alleviating that distension and pain. However, the next day was another banquet at lunch with some government and military officials. As usual, the morning tea house routine was followed by lunch and dinner banquets and heavy drinking. In spite of the physical torture, he persisted stoically. I mean, he was in excruciating pain, and if you knew him really well, you could see it, but he just had this poker face, which he developed growing up doing different types of kung fu with his fighting past. He could just hide it. Now, this became worse because gout followed, so his walking became painful. Just imagine walking on glass on top of this. That was his life. Now, in private, he would limp. But when others were around, he had to walk as though he wasn't in pain. He continued like this for a few more weeks until the national holiday when he could take a few days of rest and herbs to recover. The principal herb that was used in Dr. Li Dongyuan's formula is called Huangbai. Let's unpack this herb a bit and see what we can learn about it. So Huangbai enhances growth hormone expression. This may help to break down fats, increase muscle, and has effects on the immune system. It suppresses neural inflammation. And this is important as neural inflammation is one of the key factors in just about every chronic illness of the central nervous system. It inhibits acetylcholinesterase, which increases the available acetylcholine, which is a very important neurotransmitter. In cases of neural damage, mast cells flood in the brain, um, and this causes brain fog. This also influences the microglia, and this is thought to influence really important aspects of fibromyalgia in particular. Very importantly, this herb reduces edema by increasing urination, and it's very antifungal. Now, this is really interesting. Remember 2,000 years ago in the Suwan, they talk about when a particular gas gets to the bladder in the right amounts, then when that gas arrives, it causes urination. There is a gas called nitric oxide, 
and it has an effect on the resting tone and contractile behavior of the external urethra. So the external urethral sphincter is activated by having the right amount of nitric oxide. So there's a study that shows a functionally relevant effect of nitric oxide on the resting tone and contractile behavior of the human external urethral sphincter. So this echoes the concept of the suwan, of a gas being required to arrive at the bladder recorded 18 centuries before. Too much or too little will block the effect. It requires a sweet spot to allow the smooth muscle to relax and release the urine. So by itself, this herb is very effective. When combined with Changju, it has incredible effects. So we're going to look at the herb Changju. So while we don't have a historic account, we do have a folk tale on this. A nun of the Maoshan sect of Taoism treated people. Maoshan is known to be a deep school of Taoism, but it's also regarded with a bit of fear by outsiders. The words Maoshan to most Chinese people conjure images of witches and curses. Because of the cultural connotations, I'll call this nun the Reverend Mother Witchy. She only treated those with lots of cash because LV bags don't buy themselves. One day, a poor man went in asking for help with his paralyzed father. The Reverend Mother Witch, she told him that she would have to schedule him later. In fact, never, because she didn't deal with poor people. A younger nun named Betty was a bit dim, but was moved to help the man. She didn't know anything about herbs, but felt compelled to do something. In a well-meaning effort to help, she handed him a bushel of herbs with white flowers. Now, these weren't herbs she was told to get. She just liked pretty things and grabbed the ones with the white flowers. So the man took them home with gratitude, and uh, the young nun felt bad. She was like, what if I gave him the wrong medicine? This, you know, really, Betty, now you think of that? But, you know, she was dim, and this was back in the day where what else is she going to do besides be someone's gopher? A few weeks later, the poor man returned elated that his father was improving. The revered mother witchy did her best to make a fake smile and later grabbed Dim Betty by the arm and asked her which herb she had used. Betty had no idea. I mean, she had just grabbed some extra herbs on her trip because white flowers are pretty. Revered mother witchy took her aside and beat her with a stick for insubordination. Betty cried in bed, got mad, and packed her bags. She left in the night. As she did, she grabbed a bunch of Tangju. She went to the next city and told people, hey, I specialize in paralysis, and told the story of the man's father. She soon found that Tangju was a hit or miss when it was used for paralysis by itself. But it was really great for diarrhea and nausea. In fact, if people had diarrhea and nausea, this was an easy win. This herb went on to become one of the most utilized in East Asia. So good work, Betty. You may have been a completely useless employee, but you turned out to be a tremendous service to civilization. So let's look at Tsangju and see what it's doing. This herb is used to chase away ghosts and evil chi. And it's interesting because all of the herbs that you'll find that are useful for chasing away ghosts are antifungal. Not just a little antifungal, they're extremely antifungal. And this makes me think, well, we know that you can eat certain mushrooms and trip your eyes out. You know, people see all kinds of things eating mushrooms. We also know that many fungi are airborne. So is it possible that airborne fungi cause people to trip out and think they're seeing ghosts and that in burning these herbs, it helps to fumigate because the volatile oils get released or taking them internally has an effect to kill these fungi. I don't know, I just think it's interesting that whenever you see a ghost chasing herb in Chinese culture and look at the pharmacology, it is just incredibly antifungal. Now, the herb Tangju has been shown to stimulate gastric emptying as well as small intestine mobility by inhibiting dopamine receptors and 5-HT receptors. Now, this is interesting because there are certain types of paralysis where this would be very applicable. 
So in the off chance, you know, with the young man's father um, who had paralysis, perhaps this was part of the mechanism, which would also explain why with other types of paralysis, it was kind of a miss. Tsangju affects the intestinal immune system, modulating polysaccharides. It also can delay gastric emptying for cases of diarrhea. So bingo, that matches the folk tale perfectly. For cases of constipation, it's increasing intestinal mobility. So it seems to have a regulatory effect. There's a particular essential oil, hinosol, which is extracted from tsangju, which is a tractylodes rhizome. And this can inhibit cell growth and induces apoptosis in human leukemia. So that's nice. It's uh, telling your cells when they should die and is regulating the function of cell growth and death. The structure of oligosaccharide side chains in intestinal immune system are modulated by rhizome attractylodes. We see overall it has anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antipyretic, means it drops your temperature down, activities, as well as some regulatory function on the central nervous system, cardiovascular, and gastrointestinal systems. In particular, when stress affects digestion, this gastric motor dysfunction caused by psychological stress has effect of causing what's called functional dyspepsia. We also find that Tsangju has anti-ulcer effects. So great. We know that Huangbai is amazing. Tsangju is also a super herb. Both of them by themselves can have incredible effects on the body. Now let's look at what happens when we combine them together. So the name Ermiao, which is translated as double awesome, is actually a rename by Zhu Danxi, which before this herbal formula was called Tsangju San, which means Tsangju powder. Dr. Zhu called it double awesome powder. And this name caught on because it's just better branding. Following Zhu Danxi's example of updating the name, we call it Aquata to help English speakers get a sense for its actions. The warmth of Tsangju, the herb which uh, we mentioned second, is kept in check by the coldness of Huangbai. Huangbai goes to the kidney and bladder meridians, which cover the upper and lower part of the body. Tsangju goes to the spleen and stomach channels. Tsangju is spicy, bitter, aromatic, and warm. This makes a solid herb pair. The theory behind it is that the warm Tsangju, which lifts upward, can give Huangbai's cold and descending nature a backstage pass to the upper body. Huangbai returns the favor, offering Tsangju a ticket to the lower body. Like yin and yang, they support each other and keep each other from going too far. This means that the power of this formula can be high along with its safety. Without this underlying yin-yang balance, one can expect many side effects. This brilliant blending based on an underlying theory and tested with real-world application is one of the reasons this formula can be used so broadly. Curiously, I've used this formula for quite a bit of chronic pain, particularly when exacerbated by gut dysbiosis. I will often see people who have had an injury which won't heal. When this comes with obesity, then I will use Aquata, and it's very successful. I've used this formula as well, incidentally, to help people get off metformin, because it has such incredible effects with isla beta cell repair and blood sugar regulation. It's also incredible for gout. Ermiawan reduces serum uric acid levels and inhibits liver xanthine dehydroxygenase and xanthine oxidase in mice. This is an indispensable herb that I use daily for patients who have fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and even back pain that is associated with weight gain. Tsangju by itself can be used to, traditionally it's said to help lighten the body, and the combination of this tends to cause incidental fat loss. So there we have it, Ermiao, made up of Tsangju and Huangbai. I used to carry every herbal formula I could get my hands on. You can just imagine how this clogged up shelf space 
and mental space. Plus, it gave me a lot to dust every week. We looked at our most effective products, our automatic top sellers, and found that they coincided with the most popular and effective herbal products in East Asia. We decided to focus on the winners and then make them even better. Our research team in Chengdu upgraded these formulas using the highest quality herbs on the planet and rigorously testing them at pharmaceutical standard for quality and safety. You'll want to get your hands on this and you'll get your supplies at botanicalbiohacking.com. Thanks for listening to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Miles.